<laughs> this is the tooting sound, the sound of a just new emerging honeybee queen. And this is my grandfather, this is my king. Thanks to him, I've learned the techniques to breed bee colonies very successfully, how to make good harvest and good honey. No doubt, it has been some very hard-working days at times since I was five or seven, but these days were very rewarding, very fulfilling. That was until we started to see our yield dropping, and we witnessed very severe losses in, of colonies. My grandpa was always a step ahead to do the right things for his bees, but like many beekeepers, he could not keep up with all the new challenges. Years later, after his passing, we eventually lost all of our bees. And this was the trigger point for me, my co-founders and my sister. To leave our jobs from the tech industry, we wanted to reconnect our heart for the bees. We created Bee Futures. I am Christophe. I represent the team of beekeepers, researchers, engineers and private investors on a mission to save the bees. But I have to say, sometimes it feels that we are rather on a mission to save our own lives. This newborn honeybee queen we just heard doesn't know that in our world of 2022, she and her colony has much fewer chances to survive this winter. By the end of this evening, statistically, 35,000 honeybee colonies will have collapsed in America and in Europe. This is 10 times more than 15 years ago. A disaster is brewing in the shadows of our lives, considering that one third of every bite we eat is a product of plant fertilization delivered by the bees. So what is happening to our bees? What can we do about it? At Bee Futures, we developed technologies to address the major problems of the bees. And you may know this, but engineers like us, we love developing technologies. We love finding solutions to problems, and the bigger they are, the more clever we feel at trying to fix them. So the first thing we developed was a relatively simple IoT sensor that we placed inside the beehive. And among other things, we wanted to measure the temperature inside the colony. And I'll tell you why. Honeybees are cold-blooded animals, but as a superorganism, they keep their nest at a very steady temperature, close to 35 degrees Celsius. Some bees are tasked to warm up the hive, some others are tasked to cool it down, and many bees employ a lot of energy to vent the hive. This thermal regulation is achieved with amazing orchestration. And they do this because the steady temperature is vital for the rearing of the larvae, it protects the fertility of the queen and the drones, the boys. And 35 degrees Celsius is the optimal temperature for a good performing metabolism of the bees. So as for human, any deviation from this temperature is a sign that something is wrong. And now beekeepers can follow on an app the health of their bees instead of opening up the beehives every so often. The beekeepers can now take the necessary actions in time to replace the colonies that are not fit for the purpose of pollination. With a digital monitoring, the beekeepers can maintain a continuous pollination, which in turn produces more food. But if I'll be honest with you, this technology is also a way to grow colonies more effectively and to replace the dead faster. Clearly, we need a more holistic solution than that. We need to look at the root cause of the global bee decline. Colony collapse disorder is the expression the world has given to this cause. But the bees are not facing one single and mysterious problem, but rather a cocktail of very real and constant challenges. All beekeepers around the world agree that one of the major problems of the bees is a parasite called the varroa mite. It's the number one bee enemy worldwide. 
but the Varroa mite has been in our region since the late 70s. So he cannot explain on his own the reason for this dramatic increase in colony losses. The answer must be somewhere else. Today, I'm going to present to you our discoveries in the colony collapse disorder and our revolutionary approach to it. We wanted to look at the myriad of challenges that keep disturbing the lives of the bees. You've just learned that the bees keep the nest at a very steady temperature. But in our study, we've seen quite systematically that each time the bees are exposed to stresses, they lose this ability of keeping the temperature steady. Whether it's a climate incident that limit or delay the access to food for the bees, or whether it's a pesticide exposure to the bees, or whether it's the long transportation of the bees, the bees are not able to elevate the temperatures during the night for many days, and they are not able to cool down the hive when in the hot days over time, and with repetitive stress scenarios, this triggers some very serious dysfunction of the colony. And they are not able to develop anymore. We wanted to look into this deeper. And in our research with the University College London, we looked at the energy currency of the cells. And we also looked at the inflammation state of the body. And what we found is that for each of these scenarios, when the bees fail to thermoregulate their nest, then precisely the level of energy in their body was very low and inflammation was very high. This is a sign of metabolic stress. This is a sign of mitochondria that are deficient. And to address this problem, we know about biotechnologies that can actually repair mitochondria that are deficient for human eyes, for elderly people. And that involves using deep red light. The light penetrates the tissues, and the quantum energy brought by the light particles is just enough to kickstart the battery again. Now I could show you many graphs and the results of, uh, of research, but instead I'm going to show you a very short video that saves many words. On the left side, you have bumblebees that have been exposed to pesticides, a very controversial pesticide called the neonicotinoids. It is a video, but the bumblebees are not moving at all. They are practically dead. And on the right side are the bumblebees exposed to the light therapy. And you can see after just a few seconds of exposure that the bee recovers full mobility. Like if it was coming back to life again. This shows how biotechnologies developed for humans can actually save our pollinators. But a friend of mine corrected me some years ago and said, What about the wild bees, Christoph? You cannot bring light therapy to any one of them. And we need the wild bees just as much as honeybees. And he was right, of course. The wild bees pollinate more effectively a very wide range of plants and they fertilize the food to the rest of our ecosystem. But for them too, we have degraded their habitat in very big scale. The food is more scarce to them. They need to travel further away and eventually when they find some food, it might be toxic. We have created the vast agriculture model that produces large quantities of food in very efficient ways. But in the eyes of the bees, we have created vast Saharas. And not only these engineered crops are unfriendly to wildlife, but the agriculture practices abuses our soils as well. And tomorrow these crops might become the Saharas for ourselves. But in all fairness, it isn't going to be easy to bring biodiversity back into agriculture and maintain the production rate to feed a growing population. One may say we have dismantled a very fine Swiss watch mechanism and we have lost the manual to rebuild it. And that brings me 
to our next innovation in our fight against the colony collapse disorder. It was certainly my grandfather who sparked the idea in my head for me back in the 70s. He made this very simple but amazing observation hive. A hive filled up with a fully living honeybee colony and glass walls. And he brought it to our classroom. That day, he made my sister and I the coolest kid at school. <laughs> I could really show off that day. I could tell anything and everything about the bee colonies to my friends. I could show them the queen, and I could tell them about the bee waggle dance. The bee waggle dance is this communication the foraging bee has to tell the other bees where to find good food. The foraging bee uses body shaking and steps towards specific direction and actually retranscripts the flying distance and the azimuth angle. In other words, she's giving the GPS location of where to find the food. So many years later, with my friends at Bee Futures, we had to make our own observation hive. Quite different, but filled up with super advanced video technologies, with edge computing and artificial intelligence, of course. And we can read in real time how bees interact with the environment. The bee waggle dance, for instance, is automatically detected and decoded. And it gives us a very good idea how far the bees need to travel to find food. By overlooking the beehive entrance, we can monitor the foraging intensity of the bees. We can count any one of them. But more importantly, we can count the bees that are not returning home. Because in the event of a poisoning incident, many bees will not return home and we will raise immediately a safety warning about the environment. Back in my own country, in France, if you haven't guessed yet, <laughs> a group of progressive wine growers have understood that biodiversity should be their ally to stop the depletion of the soils. And I mean, Wine is perhaps for France the closest to what oil is to Norway. And these concerned growers are making everything in their power to keep the oil of France flowing. So these growers are already making use of the observation hive. And today, they can read how the bees respond to their actions. They can now adapt their practices. We are very excited about this technology because we feel that we now have a guiding tool to invite the pollinators back in agriculture. And I have now a much better answer to my friends when I say we save the pollinators. But with all these technologies, I have to say one last question keeps nagging me. All of these exhaustive solutions, how does it stand in front of our immense desire for consumption, because this is still leading the way. And for every bit of material we use, we keep depleting the resources of the planet and we degrade the wildlife habitat. And this is prob probably where the technology might fall a bit short. So what is left to do? Well, before I leave you, Tonight, I'd like to share with you some of the fantastic traits about the bees that might give us a clue. As a kid, I always thought the only bee queen was the overall master inside the hive, in charge of everything. The truth is quite different. Scout bees, for instance, come back inside the hive and tell the other bees about the new place they found and promote the location they found. So honeybees can take individual initiatives, but they take collective decisions for the interest of all. Does it not sound like wisdom? Did you know that house bees, the bees living inside the hive, keep social distance from the bees that, live, that go outside? That is such a wise routine to make sure that the, no, it doesn't bring any pathogens to the rest of the colony. That took us a while to implement to ourselves. <laughs> Did you know that honeybees 
are able to downregulate their reproductive growth and they can limit their consumption in anticipation for the winter. And in this way, they can live forever as a species as long as they do not exhaust their resources. And guess what? They fertilize their own food and they enrich the environment in which they live. Undisturbed by us, they know the drill and they make sure to not create problems for themselves. And that is perhaps what the King Solomon meant when he said, human will survive if we follow the wisdom of the bees. But 3,000 years later, we do have many problems to fix. And with clever solutions, we can boost pollination and food production with less resources. We can improve the health of the bees. We can make them more robust against pesticides even, and against climate changes, which are here to stay. And by using bees as biosensors, we can regain some biodiversity in human areas. So, between cleverness and wisdom, which one to choose then? The answer seems obvious, but let's ask the bees. Well, of course. Thank you very much.